At Google, we're surrounded by technology, but we may rarely think about the first pioneers and the struggles that they faced to get us to where we are today. Uh, the word brilliant is frequently used to describe Alan Turing, uh, who is not only one of the earliest computer scientists, but also a mathematician, logician, biologist, and a cryptanalyst famous for breaking the German Enigma encryption during World War II and saving millions of lives. Um, his stories inspired films, literature, and even music. Uh, and I'm honored today to introduce his nephew and biographer. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sir Dermot Turing. Um, so, thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I thought what might be of interest to you to pick out some of the uh, details of Alan Turing's life, which are perhaps some of the lesser known aspects, but I thought I'd focus on machinery. Um, I, I'm not going to go into the sort of intricacies of uh, coding of the first British computers, but I thought you might sort of like to see some of the sort of hardware, if you like, that Alan Turing worked on. And there's some really quite interesting aspects of this, because it sort of starts off really quite, quite early in his life, perhaps earlier than you, you might, might have expected. I'm sure you're all familiar with this horrible thing, which is the paper that he wrote in 1936 on computable numbers, and I expect you could actually explain to me what it means. So I'm not going to try and patronise you by giving you sort of any, any sense of it. But, of course, the, the key point here is if you take yourselves back to 1936, they hadn't actually got machinery that was capable of doing more than one thing. And that's very hard for us, from our viewpoint, to sort of grasp that idea. But the easiest way, I think, to think of it is when you go into your kitchen, your kitchen equipment is only capable of doing one thing. So you, your kettle, for example, is capable of boiling water, but it is not very useful for frying eggs in. The frying pan is great for frying eggs in, but it's pretty useless for making um, you know, sort of like uh, frothing up egg whites to make a meringue, for example. Each piece of equipment has one function. And that was the same with uh, essentially computing equipment, uh, calculating machinery that was in place around uh, the pre-war period. So the idea that Alan Turing came up with in trying to solve this mathematical problem, the Scheidung's problem, the idea of a multi-purpose machine that could change its functionality by being fed a different set of instructions, essentially what we call these days a program, um, that was just a really radical breakthrough. But of course, everybody, you know, nobody, nobody thought of this as other than just essentially a mathematical device, a theory to enable people to get to the heart of the Entscheidungs problem. But you might well then ask, well, where did this idea of a, a machine to solve mathematical problems actually come from? And the answer to this is quite interesting because this, it probably comes from the guy whose picture is on the left-hand side of this slide, um, a professor at Cambridge University called Max Newman, uh, who was giving the talks, the lectures on mathematical problems, including the Entscheidungs problem, and he'd described the Entscheidungs problem in terms of is there a me mechanical process which could be applied to any given theorem to know whether or not it was provable. And so it's this phrase, the mechanical process, that I think started Alan Turing's sort of thought processes running uh, to see if, uh, uh, see if there was a way of uh, uh, tackling the Entscheidungs problem and hence this sort of theoretical blueprint for uh, a universal computing machine. But he doesn't just leave it at this sort of theoretical um, mathematical stage. He actually, he's quite a hands-on sort of guy and so actually what he wants to do is start thinking about what would those instruction tables, the um, essentially the programs look like and uh, this, this becomes quite interesting because this is also roughly 1936 um, and he's explaining to this lady and this lady is the mother of his uh, school days friend Christopher Morecambe. He's still in touch with her sort of 
uh, for about 10 years after leaving school, to about 10 years after Christopher Walken's died. Any of you seen The Imitation Game? You know about this sort of, it's slightly mythical actually, this story about this sort of strong childhood friendship you have with Christopher Walken. In fact, they only knew each other for about 15 months. Alan was much more interested in Christopher's mother, as this lady, uh, and uh, he's explaining to her in the mid-1930s the rules of Go. Yeah, you know the Japanese game that you play with black and white counters? Yeah, yeah, there's lots of people nodding, okay. So what he's doing, he's actually writing algorithmic processes down to explain to her how to play Go. And this is, this is quite interesting, because he's actually not only thinking about the theory of a universal computing machine, he's thinking about how you actually write programs. And he's also thinking at the same time about how you go about building machines. Now this thing, uh, he started building this machine uh, in about 1937, 38. Um, and what he's trying to do, okay, there's, there's some mathematicians amongst you, the Riemann zeta function might, uh, oh yes, we're getting one or two nods, so that's good. I, don't ask me, I mean, I have no idea what it is. Anyway, it's something to do with prime numbers and how spaced out they are. No, I don't mean spaced out. That could mean something involving the use of in, inappropriate substances. But, uh, uh, but how you know they sort of they're, they're not evenly they're not evenly distributed, are they, along the sort of uh, uh, numerical axis? So the Riemann zeta function sort of helps you understand how they're spaced out. So I understand. Okay, so he wanted to build an analog machine that would uh, help find the solutions to the zeta function. Uh, and this involved cutting, apparently cutting um, gear teeth, uh, each of which would have a prime number of spokes around it, a prime number of teeth around the uh, the um, around the wheel. And you put these put these gear wheels together, and uh, then it, you crank the handle, and uh, it would spit out the solutions. So this blueprint, which is not drawn by Alan Turing, but it's of his machine, it's actually in the archive at King's College, Cambridge. And apparently he started making these wheels out of brass, these gear wheels. Uh, and if you visited his rooms at King's College, Cambridge, just before the Second World War, you would probably have tripped over them. They were scattered all over the floor and all over the table. Um, and unfortunately, World War II broke out and prevented, essentially, the uh, machine ever um, being assembled. But uh, or, So we never know whether it worked. And, it would be very nice to know one day if somebody could actually use this blueprint to try and um, uh, uh, put, put the thing together. Uh, anyway, so he's not only thinking about the theory of machinery and he's thinking about uh, the uh, possibilities for programming, but he's also uh, very interested in a sort of hands-on sense in the hardware. Um, and that probably makes him an ideal candidate to be hired to join the code-breaking team at Bletchley Park because, as you all know, the key problem in 1939 was that the Germans were using the Enigma machine to encipher their uh, communications and with the vast number of permutations of the way the machine can be set up, there is a serious challenge. You can't use World War I methods for code-breaking to solve the problem of how was the Enigma machine set up this morning, it would just take too many people too long. You need a mechanical method to go through at least a big chunk of the permutations and eliminate the impossible. So by, again, if you've watched the imitation game, you will know, that because this is now an established fact, because that's what movies like the imitation game do for us, don't they? They tell us what the facts are. You will know that it is an established fact that uh, um, in the nick of time, with five seconds to go before the D-Day landings, Alan Turing finally put the, soldered the last collection on his uh, bomb machine and lo and behold the bomb was able to spew out decrypts of uh, uh, German messages just in time to save hundreds of British lives, but unfortunately not American lives because you guys got to go on the wrong beach. I'm sorry about that. but. Uh, <laughs> Actually, some of that might not be true. And in fact, the bit that is particularly not true is that it took the entire war for this machine to work. Alan Turing had designed a bomb, which is this thing you can see on this slide, um, to find 
at least some candidates which were potential plausible settings for the way the Enigma machine had been set up. And he designed a methodology and uh, uh, for um, that and, and uh, discussed with an engineer called uh, Doc Keen um, how that might be transformed into a, a real device. That had all been done by Christmas 1939. At which point the war in Europe had involved the Russians and the Germans taking over Poland, but otherwise there wasn't really a hot war going on at all uh, in Europe. And so by the time the Germans invaded Norway in April 1940 and France in May 1940, they had actually got a prototype machine delivered at Bletchley Park and by the time of the Battle of Britain, September 1940, the bomb machine was already producing intelligence. Intelligence that could be used in the Battle of Britain to help the uh, Polish and uh, British forces, air forces, defeat the Luftwaffe. Um, and so the first real use of this intelligence was actually really, really early in the war. So, um, but that's very interesting. But the point is, of course, that Alan Turing had come up with a design for a working machine. Now, his prototype was improved by a, another Cambridge mathematician called Gordon Welshman. Um, but the fact is, it happened really astonishingly early in the war. And this is a very interesting machine, this, um, because it's actually a digital machine. It's producing a yes or no answer. OK, it's not a universal machine, because it's a single purpose device. It's designed to find settings on Enigma um, machines. But uh, it's, actually, it's actually quite interesting. It's programmed. It's programmed around the back. There's a very complex sort of festoon of wires and stuff which enables it to be set up to solve a different problem uh, you know, every day or for every uh, Enigma network that was in use. But, it, but this, is, this is a step up from the Riemann Zeta function machine. It's not an analog machine. It is digital. Uh, it's not electronic. Uh, and it's programmable only within a limited sort of purpose range. But that's, but that's really, uh, it's, a, it's a big step on the road towards universal computing machinery. You may have come across this thing. This is Colossus. This is the machine that was used at Bletchley Park to break a different kind of German code, the teleprinter code, uh, which was enciphered on a machine called the Lorentz SZ42 and the Colossus again was another step forward on the road towards modern computing technology because this is an electronic machine unlike the bomb which is electromechanical it's got moving parts in it this is an electronic machine and what's more the contents of one of the messages they were testing is actually programmed into the machine by flicking switches which uh, set, which store the contents of, of, of a message electronically using uh, valves. I'm sorry, in American Tube. tubes, that's right. Yes, you call, them, you call them tubes, we call them valves. But anyway, um, these days we call them transistors. But, uh, um, <laughs> but um, OK, so the... the uh, Colossus is, is a very interesting thing. Now, I can't claim that Alan Turing designed Colossus. This would be a complete uh, travesty. Um, but what we, what we do know is that he was involved in the team that was headed up by none other than Max Newman, that professor who started Alan Turing off on the computable numbers um, work back in the 30s. Um, Max Newman was heading up a machine group one of the responsibilities of the machine group was to uh, develop things like Colossus. Um, and Alan Turing was a member of the machine group. So he was essentially a consultant to the project. Uh, so he knew all about it. And that's, although he wasn't involved in the design, it meant that he was very well equipped in terms of know-how for the big post-war projects, both here in the United States, but also in the UK, there were going to be massive computer building programs. Everybody wanted to try and, try and bring the whole concept of a multifunction, a universal computing machine to life. 
And the reason they wanted to do this, because they were absolutely, I mean, this was, this was basically John von Neumann's project, which was to try and find machines that would solve much more quickly the very, very difficult equations that were needed to do, uh, needed to be processed for doing things like uh, designing atom bombs. The military needed computing power. And instead of hiring roomfuls of people with adding machines, which is the way they'd gone about it in the past, they thought that actually having a computing machine that could be reprogrammed to do different kinds of mathematical calculations was a really good idea. And the Brits had pretty much the, the same, same thinking. In fact, they had this sort of vision of a, a national computer that people would be able to send their problems off to and the computing the compute, you know, the national computing service would uh, solve their problems for them. And you know, would, would we need one, or might we even need two computers to serve the entire United Kingdom? And that, and that was the kind of thinking at the time. So, Alan Turing was hired to work on the UK's computing project, um, which uh, was. Uh, funded by the National Physical Laboratory in, in the UK. Um, and he was basically hired as their sort of com chief computer designer. And he wrote a paper heavily influenced by John von Neumann's work, um, which was going to lead to the creation of something called the Automatic Computing Engine. It's a nod back to the Babbage calculator, calculators of the 19th century. Um, this picture is of ACE while it was sort of being built, that picture is probably mid-1950s, I would say about 55, 56. The ACE, which Alan Turing designed, didn't actually complete its building process until 1959, which was 12 years after he'd completed his design. Alan Turing did not kick his heels for that 12 years. In fact, he got so fed up that uh, within two years of completing his design, he'd moved on uh, and again he'd moved because he'd been phoned up by his old mate Max Newman, who was now the Professor of computer and Computing at Manchester University. Max Newman had asked the UK government if he could take away the leftover bits of Colossus at the end of the war. And he filled a seven-ton truck with pieces of Colossus and took them to Manchester where he built something that the London Times described as uh, the mechanical brain, and rather better, there's another UK newspaper described it as a marvel of our time. That's a picture of it from the London Times. Um, it's got wires all hanging from the ceiling, and it really does look a bit of a mess. Um, uh, the it, I, I thought you might like to hear from from uh, a quote from. Uh, uh, my book about uh, about this, and I, I'm, I can do this shamelessly because I'm not actually quoting my own words here. Um, the Manchester Computing Laboratory is actually described by uh, Professor Williams, who had invented the um, memory device that was being used in in, in this machine, uh, uh, and he describes the uh, Royal Society. Computing Machine Laboratory, which sounds very grand. So he's, Professor Williams says this, a fine sounding phrase, but what was the reality? It was one room in a Victorian building whose architectural features are best described as late lavatorial. The, room, <laughs> the walls were of brown glazed brick and the door was labeled magnetism room. And in fact, actually this building's quite interesting because it's where Rutherford had done his ex experiments at the end of the 19th century on splitting the atom. And so actually the brown glazed brick, it's still there, and you're not really allowed to go into the building because it's a bit radioactive. So it's an interesting place. OK, but they actually were able to use this machine to solve some real problems. And this is quite interesting because it had a memory of 1,024 bits. So there's not really a lot you can do with, um, it's not really sort of powerful computing um, machine. But they got this problem, which again, Max Newman is a very clever guy, had worked out that there was a problem about Mersenne primes. OK, so again, the mathematicians are actually will be nodding. OK, 2 to the power of n minus 1. Are those numbers prime or are they not? Well, some of them are and some of them aren't, is the answer to that question. But Mersenne, who was a French monk from the uh, 16th century, had made a list of um, these 
numbers where for values of n up to, let me check my notes, 257. And he said, these ones are prime and these ones are not. But to do the sums to actually work out whether for n equals 257 requires an awful lot of squared paper uh, and an awful lot of patience. And so Max Newman thought, aha, in binary, 2 to the n minus 1 is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. One, 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 one. So in other words, it's a great problem for a computer that's only got a memory of 1,024 bits. And so he got the uh, computer working on this, and they checked Mersenne's work. And this is all very interesting, because it all found its way in, once again into the Times newspaper. So not only were they running this splendid, sort of rather grubby-looking photo, but they were also running a nice little article called The Mechanical Brain. Now you can see from Saturday, the 11th of June, 1949. The Mechanical Brain, answer found to 300-year-old sum. So it goes on like this. But the interesting thing about this is it's not so much what it says about the 300-year-old sum, it's actually what it says about Alan Turing, because they phoned him up. And Newman was out of the lab that day, and so they got Alan Turing, and what he said was this. This is only a foretaste of what is to come, and only the shadow of what is going to be. We have to have some experience with the machine before we really know its capabilities. It may take years before we settle down to the new possibilities, but I don't see why it shouldn't enter into one of the fields normally covered by the human intellect, and eventually compete on equal terms. I don't think you can even draw the line about writing sonnets, though the comparison is perhaps a little bit unfair, because a sonnet written by a machine will be better appreciated by another machine. <laughs> All this about a computer that's got a memory of 1,024 bits. Oh dear. Um, when you can imagine that in the rather staid environment of the early 1950s, or rather late 1940s as we were, um, this sort of didn't go down particularly well. And um, Max Newman's wife wrote a letter to one of her friends um, while this was going on. And she said this, did you see the extraordinary report in the Times two weeks ago on the Manchester calculating machine with the fantastic remarks attributed to Alan Turing and Max's letter the following day trying to clear things up? The Times wired Alan, who isn't on the telephone, to ring up their office. And they interviewed him on the phone. He's wildly innocent about the ways of reporters. And he has a bad stammer when he's nervous or puzzled. It was a great shock to him when he saw the Times and to Max, who'd been flying back from Belfast that day. We had a wretched weekend, starting at midnight on the Friday night when some sub-editor of a local paper rang up to get a story. By Max, by Sunday, Max was getting a bit gruff, and when he said, what do you want, to one newspaper, the reporter replied, only to photograph your brain. <laughs> so we had, we had some fun and games at the end of the 1940s with the uh, Manchester uh, baby computer. Actually, that was kind of like a proof of concept. And what they wanted to do was to use that to prove that it was actually worth spending some money on a decent computer, which was um, commercially manufactured. And so this is a photograph of it. It was delivered to Manchester University in, I think, about 1951. And this was sometimes called the Manchester Mark I or the Ferranti Mark I. Uh, it's a, as you can see, a rather more sort of swish looking thing. And there's a sort of marketing photograph with a sort of elegant young woman sitting in front of it, sort of, um, uh, you know, looking very professional. Um, you've also got uh, an example of what a computer program looks like uh, from the uh, same period. Um, all these pound signs and forward slashes and half signs, they're programming in some, basically in the teleprinter code, which is uh, a nightmare. And you can see Alan Turing's handwritten comments on the program with, how did this happen, written across it. Something, something's gone wrong in this particular program. It was not easy. It was not easy. So, but actually, I think this is very interesting. Here's a picture of him with two of his colleagues. He's the one standing looking to the left. Um, uh, 
he's standing by the Manchester Mark One, and what is he doing? He's not actually designing the machine at this stage in the 1950s. What he's doing is designing the programs, and he's designing the programs to solve problems that are of interest to him. He's moved into a completely different sphere. What he's interested in is developmental biology, and he is modelling the... Uh, way that chemicals diffuse through uh, an embryo to see if he can explain problems in shape and form. So to quote him again, why is a horse not a spherically symmetrical object? There must be, there must be some variations in concentration of chemicals or whatever it is that, uh, that cause the organism to develop the way that it does. So he's looking at plants, he's looking at animals, he's looking at things like the uh, patterns that you see on the coats of leopards or Frisian cows or whatever. So he's, he can explain some of these using his uh, differential equations and he's using the computer to essentially run contour maps for him uh, of the results from these differential equations. So you can see that he's taken, this is a piece of squared paper that he has written out the uh, results that the computer has given him, bearing in mind that it probably came out on a piece of punched tape, so he's had to translate it back into uh, squared paper. There are graphical readouts on computers in the 1950s. So he's written the data in these two digit um, hexadecimal um, uh, codes um, and he's drawn a contour map over it so when you've got high values he's shaded it darker than where he's got medium and low values and so you can see there's a pattern emerging from that which might or might not sort of look like I don't know a, a coat on an animal for example. So that's what he's been doing so he's moved completely now from a machine as a theoretical thing for solving a problem in pure maths, right through to using a computer as a tool to help him uh, solve a problem in biology, much in the same way that we would use computers nowadays. And all that in the course of uh, about 15 years. I mean, it's quite rough already. Uh, as we all know, um, Alan Turing died far too, far too young, but I thought you might just like the um, way that the UK tabloid press sort of reported his death. I mean, some of this, it's sad, but you just have to... Um, there, there is some dark humour in here. OK, so we've got scientist robot brain man is found dead, and then you've got a picture of him, and then underneath that you probably can't read, it, read what it says. But it says, Dr Turing, he fed the brain. So... Um, <laughs> And uh, mechanical brain expert found dead. Um, scientist took poison. Apparatus in room. You know, I mean, this is this is classic sort of tabloid reporting. And uh, did own cooking. I mean, what? You know. Uh, <laughs> um, so, anyway, so there is there is there is there is something. I should think it was probably pretty distressing for the family to read all this stuff at the time. But uh, uh, sixty years on, it. Um, it, it, it's it's got its uh, entertainment value. Okay, um, I'm, I'm done with the uh, f um, sort of formal speech part of this. Um, thank you for listening patiently. I'd be very happy to take questions, and then I think at some stage I will be encouraged to go outside. And uh, if people are interested, I'm signing books as well. So, but anyway, let me let me stay here and take take questions to to begin with. And Rachel's coming around with a mic. Can you give the, uh, the history of your title? Uh, I can. It's got nothing to do with Alan Turing. Um, but, uh, um, OK. In um, the middle part of the 17th century, um, King Charles I was trying to raise funds to... Uh, establish a new British colony on the northeast coast of uh, uh, the North American continent. Uh, in fact, what he was trying to do was to found a colony called New Scotland, or Nova Scotia. 
And these kinds of ventures uh, cost money, and the tax raising uh, methods of the time were rather poor, as those of you who know your English history will know. This is what caused Charles I to uh, have his head chopped off, is his uh, inadequate approach to taxation. Well, if you talk to Americans about British taxation, this is kind of dangerous territory. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, um, <laughs> um, so, but all right, we're talking, talking about Canada at the moment, rather than, rather than, rather than the other 13 colonies. But uh, um, So what happened was that Charles I was selling, selling essentially titles. He was selling, selling peerages and, in my case, baronetcies, herited, heritable titles, that you would contribute so much money to the Nova Scotia scheme, and then uh, and you would you know, get, get given this sort of stupid thing, which is sort of like a piece of furniture that you can pass on to your, pass on to your children. So that's, that's where it comes from. But as you say, it's got nothing to do with Alan Turing. But <laughs> I've never been to Nova Scotia, but never mind. <laughs> well, so I just wanted to ask you, um, so obviously a number of biographical works about touring have appeared over the years, and um, I was just curious if there were any uh, particular things you felt that they had got wrong, and uh, if... if um, uh, no, I don't, think, I don't think there's anything that people have particularly, previous biographers have particularly got wrong. Um, uh, Andrew Hodges, whose biography is probably the, you know, the most well known and probably the most sort of thorough in terms of you know exhaustive coverage of things, he wrote that thirty years ago, and and actually that's a long time ago in terms of knowing new things about what happened at Bletchley Park. There's been lots of revelations about uh, uh, Alan Turing's wartime work in particular, including some new documents that are released by the uh, uh, UK equivalent of the NSA, GCHQ, released some documents like last year. Um, so it, it's not so much that there's anything wrong, it's just that there's more detail available now. And I also think I, I've been sort of slightly, well, I, to, to make this sort of um, not not sort of sound like I'm, I'm wanting to uh, be negative about other biographers, because I, I don't think that that wasn't part, ever part of my mission. But um, I am slightly curious and maybe not comfortable in some senses with the way that Alan Turing comes across I mean, we all get our mental picture of him from watching stuff in the media, don't we? I mean, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch's performance in The Imitation Game is a great. I mean, it's a great movie, but uh, you know, that that's kind of the Alan Turing that we carry around with each other. That, and and you know, is that true? Um, and there's been a number of sort of um, what turned out in some cases to be myths when I looked into them about sort of you know, his childhood and uh, his upbringing and uh, how he got on with his work colleagues and so forth. And, and I, I did feel to some extent that there's a, a need to, first of all, investigate that and see whether, see whether those myths turned out to be, have any substance. And on the whole, they turn out to be over-dramatisations. And, uh, you know, I think Alan Turing would have fit in quite happily here working with you guys. And you probably thought he was no different from, you know, half your other work colleagues. He wasn't that weird, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, at least that's the impression you get from talking to the people who work with him at Bletchley Park, people who work with, work with him in Manchester, you know. I mean, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily have wanted to... Uh, have him at your sherry party. Indeed, my father didn't want to have him at his sherry party. Badly dressed, rude to the other guests, um, fish out of water, very uncomfortable in that kind of social setting. Would have thought working here would have been absolutely great because, you know, you're all talking about... <laughs> none, of, none of you have ever been to a sherry party in your lives and, and what, what's more, you'd all be talking about the stuff that you all enjoy talking about together. So, you know, it's kind of... You just put people in the right environment. So... You know, I think I think there's sort of been a there's been a a tendency, if you like, for uh, the actors who are portraying him to sort of make him out as being this sort of sort of a social genius, when actually he might have been a bit more normal, a bit more approachable. Yeah, a clever guy, but you know, you all work with really clever people, so you know, you know, that doesn't mean that it's sort of like he's. 
unattainably distant the, his cleverness. So I think you know I think it's more in some senses, to try and sort of normalise things. I, I wouldn't want to say that any of the other biographers had, were guilty of the hype themselves. There's, there's some sort of nuances that I wouldn't perhaps go along with. But, uh, you know, I think it's just a matter of bringing the story up to date and perhaps normalising it a bit against some of the dramatisations that we'll have seen and built up our own picture of. Hi, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about what you were just talking about with uh, some of the recent information that's been coming out about uh, Colossus. Um, I listened to the Bletchley Park podcast, and they were talking about that too, and they were saying that uh, as much as we now know about Enigma, we, not, we might come to know about Colossus, much of which was, de was still classified until recently. And they never really talked, though. Do you, what, what, what do you know about what Turing's role was on Colossus. I know Newman was ahead. Uh, what did Turing have, what, what role did Turing play in it? Do we know? Um, well, um, more than what I've already said to you this afternoon, uh, I think it's probably not right to imagine that Alan Turing was very closely involved in uh, Colossus. What I can tell you is that he was certainly one of the uh, being one of the sort of top co-breaking team at Bletchley Park, um, when they found the teleprinter code problem, which sort of surfaced early in the war, um, they certainly gave it to him as one of the, and indeed a bunch of others, to, to work on. And so he uh, was certainly responsible for some of the uh, methodologies they were using to... Uh, try and break into the these codes um uh so there was a there's a technique called turingismus for example which i'm not going to try and explain to you but it involves basically adding together two two messages to try and find out where the settings on the wheels were and you're you're basically doing binary addition and seeing some patterns coming out of that tells you tells you something about the way that uh, way that the machine was set up um so we know that we know that he was involved in uh, the teleprinter code project, um, but also I think the real work on uh, developing Colossus as a machine to solve the the problems was basically the brainchild of other people, because by that stage Alan Turing moved on to different different role. So by 1942, uh, he's moving across from being. Uh, a code breaker essentially to being uh, I wouldn't say in charge of but uh, to have a role within uh, essentially a security organization that's looking at the security of allied communications so he's spending time over here in the US uh, he's looking at things like the machinery that's being used to uh, encrypt voice communications so when and the classic example of this is Roosevelt and Churchill having conversations over the radio telephone. Um, the Germans were listening to those for the first three years of the war. Uh, so Alan Turing sent over to the US to check out the security of the device that had been invented here at Bell Labs, actually in New York, um, to uh, encrypt those um, communications. Uh, he's also checking out the uh, effectiveness of... Um, uh, written communication security. So the, basically the, the Allies' own um, teleprinter um, encryption technique. So um, he's kind of moved across from being a code breaker into being more of a sort of security person. But I think that the idea of Newman's machine group is actually quite, quite good because that encompasses sort of both sides of that divide but um, it just means that his roles changed a bit and he's moved away from the sort of front line of front line of co-breaking which means that the Colossus project while he was aware of it and as I say cons basically acting as consultant to it it's not really his project thank you for a long time people wanted it to be because you know you got Alan Turing the father of the computer the author of the computable numbers paper the great Bretchy Park co-breaker of course Colossus had to you know but that was that was like a guess in the absence of decent quality information and I think uh, I think nowadays there's enough known to be sure that that's 
not really his main thing. He knew all about it, but he wasn't really doing it. Uh, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about the story of writing this book. You know, what inspired it? How much of it was internal knowledge in the family? Um, how long it took you to write it? What were the hard parts, etc.? Um, thank you for the question. Um, in fact, there were about five questions in there, weren't there? But uh, <laughs> um, I think you've probably got the flavour already of some of the things that were sort of slightly nagging at me before I started work on it, and whether I could, you know, whether I could investigate these myths, if you like, to find out whether they were myths, um, and also to bring the story up to date a bit. Um, I also felt that for a non-mathematical reader, a non-specialist reader, somebody who isn't prepared to say, right, I am now tanked up with enough Starbucks coffee that I can tackle chapter three and this business about computable numbers. Not everybody, not everybody has got the intellectual courage to sort of take that journey. Um, so I thought that there might be something that I as a non-mathematician could sort of, you know, bring to a wider audience with, a, with that hopefully getting bogged down too much in that kind of stuff. So that, that was part of it. Uh, and then you asked sort of how long did it take and what were the hard parts. And the really interesting thing about it was that it didn't take any like as long as I thought it was going to because the hard parts, well, apart from things like computable numbers, which I recognised were out of my depth, so I wasn't even going to try and sort of, you know, swim in those waters. Um, so, but. The really interesting thing is how easy it all was, how easy it was because people make stuff available to you and you know, actually going and talking to people. It was really interesting. People opened up doors. They said, have you thought about this? And did you know about so-and-so? And, and, you know, and you know, actually suddenly you find that loads of people were really, really interested in the project and wanted to sort of help with it. And so um, you know, I have to say it's been a, it's been a really a truly good experience. It's been very, very good. Is that is that the positive note to finish on? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, sounds like it is. <laughs>